Um, so I want to say a warm welcome to everyone joining us today. I hope you're all doing well. I'm so happy to welcome you back for another edition of the Democracy Dialogues. Uh, I'm your host, Victoria Kuketz. For those of you who are new today, it's a pleasure to meet you. And for those of you who are coming back, uh, great to see you back. So we're really excited. We have a, a great and engaging and in-depth conversation program for all of you. And I hope you'll honestly all actively take part. Um, but first I'd love to have all of you introduce yourselves to me and to one another and to our guests. So if you wanna use the chat function, um, please say your names and what organizations you're joining us from today. So as you saw in the title, we have a pretty complex topic that we're gonna try and talk through. Is social media the enemy of a vibrant and inclusive democracy? I think it's safe to say for many of us that we're long time and quite frequent users of social media, myself included. We see the positive and democratizing potential of the, these platforms, you know, global interconnectivity, limitless learning, the ability to create a public profile, not to mention the opportunities to incite momentum and start a movement. But we also know there's a sharp doubleness to all of this. Many of these platforms that initially helped spread democracy are also diminishing it by intentionally cultivating fertile ground for polarization, for misinformation, and for discord. More and more frequently, we're hearing public servants and more explicitly politicians are experiencing this duality and they're retiring from public office. You know, uh, Nayad Nenshig and Catherine McKenna are two high profile examples of people that come to mind who've experienced intense online hate and vitriol. We saw this also migrate off, off screen recently in real life when Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was pelted with gravel and received death threats at a campaign stop in London. And even worse, and, and you know, it, brings us all great sadness to say this, but in the UK, we saw Joe Cox and Sir David Amos, two British MPs were actually murdered over political issues. And this is something that we have to take very seriously and cannot let continue. So as a starting point to get us all thinking and so we can hear your voices, I'm wondering if I can ask you all to take a moment to tell us, uh, to answer two poll questions. So number one, Ashley, if you can put it in the, uh, in the poll, on balance, do you think social media is good for democracy or bad for democracy? I mean, that was quick. 100% of people are saying bad for democracy. So, you know, let's, uh, let's hold on to that and, and continue to talk through it and problematize all of this. Um, and we have another poll question for you as well. Ashley, can you put that one up? So that's poll number one. Number two is, yes, here we go. Would you ever consider running for office bearing in mind the current social media landscape? Okay, we have a bit more fluctuation here. We have 20% saying yes, I would, and 70, around 75% saying no, never. And I think that, you know, that shows the complexity and the depth of the issue. So I wanna say thanks to all of you for putting your opinions in the polls. Um, I, I wanna infuse those experiences and viewpoints into our conversation today. But first, I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement. So today we're meeting virtually, so you may not be on the same ground as me. I'm currently in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, and Mississaugas of the New Credit Territory. So instead, please join me in acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands we're on today and the, please reflect on those importance of those lands. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving relationships between nations and collaborating in the spirit of reconciliation. And as I've shared in previous sessions, I'm a first generation Canadian on both sides. My parents come from Australia, which is another white settler colony and the former colonized India, as well as Trinidad and Tobago. So my commitment to a more equ equitable future is deeply fe felt and in solidarity with respect to my own maternal ancestors having been indentured laborers. Since we've met, Canada has observed its first national day for truth and reconciliation, a day when we've called to mind histories, names, and the harms that Indigenous peoples have experienced intergenerationally. May we condemn, think, and act against these injustices every day with a shared commitment to do and be better and no more, with a full commitment to acknowledging the histories, lands, and systems we benefit from every day. And I just wanna share that I've continued my learning this past week by reading about the importance of treaty rights and relationships during what was Treaty Recognition Week. Um, and Ashley's gonna share the, the link to that if you'd like to learn about uh, more about treaties and recognition as well. 
And I also wanted to commemorate the fact that I learned earlier today that November 8th is National Indigenous Veterans Day. So may we thank and honor all Indigenous veterans for their service to Canada. So that's enough for me. <laughs> um, with all of that in mind, I think it's time to welcome our amazing guests to the stage, uh, to the virtual stage. So I'd like to welcome Amira al journalist and director of the Canadian Foundation for Race Relations, as well as commissioner uh, of the Canadian Commission on Democratic Expression at the Public Policy Forum, and Sabrina Dellen, executive director at the Samara Center for Democracy and SFU fellow at the Morris J. Wask Center for Democracy. Welcome, Amira and Sabrina. Hi. Hi, how are you doing today? Thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Um, and so I hope you're all, you're, how are you both doing? Okay. Oh, for a Monday, pretty good. Yeah, for a yes. Monday with a time change, fine. <laughs> yeah, I know we're all kind of getting used to it, but we're just so happy that you could join us. Um, I think like to roll right into it, uh, you know, Sabrina, we're really excited to hear about the work that you and the SMAR team have been doing on the Sambot. Um, and so I'm hoping I can turn things over to you first so that you can kind of set the stage for us by giving us a high level overview of the work that you've been doing on tra mm -hmm. tracking toxic tweets um, received by a selection of candidates in the most recent election. You bet. Give me two seconds and I'll get my slides up here. Thank you. Okay, so Victoria, thanks so much. And thanks to the Democracy Dialogues uh, for having me on today to talk about Samara's work. Um, what I'm gonna do over the next few minutes is give you a quick overview of SAMBOT. This was a project that we ran during the recent federal election. Uh, we know that the toxicity of online political conversations is a barrier to civic engagement. It's a key reason for why people steer clear of the political conversation or leave politics or just uh, never even contemplate entering it. So for us, uh, some of the roots of this work lie in a 2019 report that we produced called Field Guide to Online Political Conversations, which looked at digital civic engagement and found that nearly half of social media users stay out of political conversations out of fear of being criticized. A lot of people in our society <clears throat> simply don't feel safe sharing their political views online. And they're increasingly concerned about the anger that's radiating off of the political conversation. And this is among the findings <clears throat> in the recent uh, online hate speech and racism in Canada study from the Canadian Race Relations Foundation carried out by Amin, Amira and team. So this is a problem of our era and at the Samara Center we wanted to do something in response. You can't change what you haven't measured so we decided to carve off a small slice of the online political conversation and analyze it. We did this by tracking toxic tweets received by incumbent candidates and party leaders in the lead up to election day. We did this by partnering with a startup tech company in Edmonton called Areto Labs and together we deployed Sambot, an AI trained through machine learning. So SAM stands for Samara Areto Monitor Bot. SAM makes predictions about whether someone will consider text toxic or not. It can also review millions of tweets and distinguish one that is threatening or profane from one that's just kind of mean. Elections are a period of high toxicity online. So we wanted to use this recent one as an opportunity to not only collect data, but to increase public awareness around this problem. For us, it was a matter of measuring the obvious. <clears throat> and this really resonated with the media and the wider political community as well. Now, we only tracked uh, tweets received by incumbent candidates and party leaders. That's 300 accounts, and we were only on Twitter. So I'll give you a sense of what we found. In our first week, we had analyzed about 350,000 tweets and found that 7% were severely toxic. So this means that they would warrant getting blocked or reported. And we also found that the Liberals, Conservatives and the Greens were getting the most toxicity in that first week of the election. 
We shared uh, weekly reports from the digital campaign trail throughout the election. You can find them on sambot.ca. I'm just giving some select highlights today. If we look at the last week of the campaign, just that week alone, we captured about half a million tweets. And you can see the breakdown here in terms of toxicity. 4% of the tweets we tracked uh, that week were sexually explicit. And that number sounds quite small, but it translates into 20,000 tweets coming at just a handful of accounts in just one week. So it's important to note that the toxicity is not evenly spread across all 300 accounts that we tracked. And 7% of the tweets in that week uh, contained identity attacks. That um, is equivalent to 34,000 tweets. And um, not a surprise, but still quite awful, women get the most toxic tweets, uh, more than men, and the tweets that they receive are generally personal and misogynistic. So this shows a huge difference in your experience at work, your sense of safety, and just generally how much emotional energy you have to expend as a candidate or a staffer in dealing with abuse online. It's baked into uh, your public service. So navigating this torrent of vitriol is the reality on the digital campaign trail and in office. It's what faces candidates and their staffers day in and day out. Now, as I mentioned, a very small portion of these tweets warrant getting blocked or reported, but for the most part, what's coming through at a rate of dozens, hundreds, and thousands of day is just toxic. And it would wear anyone down, whether you're on the receiving end of these types of messages or if you're just observing the conversation, which is public. So this circumstance is doing incredible harm to our democracy. This chart shows the toxicity attributes that were used in our analysis. Over the course of five weeks, Sam tracked over 2 million tweets aimed at just 300 accounts. And toxicity held steady throughout the campaign period. About 20% of all the tweets we tracked were labeled as toxic. So this tells us something important about the state of the online political conversation but also the conditions of work for those seeking office. Being the target of digital vitriol affects not only who enters politics, but also who stays. Toxicity in digital political spaces is hindering representation as well as participation in our democracy. So right now we're working on a final report with the Sambot data where we're doing a deeper dive into the 2 million tweets that we tracked. And we'll be putting together some recommendations aimed at improving what I've outlined here. So please watch for that. So thanks for your attention with this brief overview of the Sambot project. I'll pass it back to Victoria now. Thanks so much for that, Sabrina. And we really appreciate you setting the scene there. These are all kind of issues that we'll dig in deeper to uh, during our conversation, but appreciate you, you know, really kind of labeling it, uh, you know, the issues of representation, the erosion of democracy, and kind of the other key themes in this conversation. Um, Amira, I'd love to invite you to weigh in as well. Um, wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your role as a commissioner in the Canadian Commission uh, for Democratic Expression, as well as your work with the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. Uh, really interested to hear about the blockade initiative and, and really anything else that you'd like to highlight in, in terms of this conversation. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Victoria. Thanks so much, Sabrina, for your comments. Thanks for everyone who's put today uh, today's event on. Um, yeah, no, I think, uh, I mean, just the snapshot that Sabrina just shared really, you know, tells us what many of us already know, and that is that the online spaces can become extremely toxic, extre extremely um, exclusive to people who can take that kind of toxicity and can really, in you know, encourage those of us who are not comfortable with that to just drive us off the platforms. And that's what we've been quite concerned about um, in terms of how folks feel unsafe online. And there are real world consequences as well to that toxicity that Victoria um, talked about very briefly in the introduction to today's discussion, um, and which many of us are aware of. So the Canadian Commission for Democratic Expression uh, was is a commission that has been uh, put on by Public Policy Forum, and it has a three-year mandate 
to look at the impact of digital technologies on public life and Canadian democracy. Um, last year, which was year one, uh, we sort of, you know, heard from a variety of academics, experts, community members to really, you know, lay out the problems uh, that exist online. And, you know, there's so many stats out there. I mean, I could spend my entire time talking about it, but just to give people a flavor um, of what we're dealing with here. So for instance, um, the Institute for Strategic Dialogue in the UK identified more than 6,600 online pages, accounts, or groups in Canada that were spreading white supremacist or misogynistic views online, and that Canada on a per capita basis was shown to be one of the most active countries in the world when it came to spreading toxic views. And another study by Moonshot UK found that online searches for violent right-wing extremist content increased up to 324% between January and April of last year in six Canadian cities. So that's just to give just a very quick sort of synopsis of the problem that the commission was, you know, is trying to address, you know, what what is to be done about this? What sort of legislative framework is necessary? Um, and so, you know, the first report came out with six recommendations, areas that the federal government can look at when it comes to trying to sort of put guardrails um, on the information highway, the online space, uh, to better protect folks from, you know, uh, hate speech in particular, um, and how to really oversee social media platforms that tend to tell us that they're doing all the right things, but the proof is in the pudding. And the reality is, is, is it's, not, it's not happening the way it should be. Um, and so basically what it actually feels like for those who've ever tried to report um, harmful speech online, try to you know uh, get themselves uh, protected from that, uh, is that it can feel like a bit of a wild, wild west of speech because it's a very inconsistent way that the platforms are actually addressing these issues despite all of the, the spotlight that has come onto the problems um, and despite you know real concerns and legitimate concerns about freedom of expression so the freedom of expression uh, is of course a key factor um, and one of the really important aspects of online spaces that you know at the very beginning was heralded as a way to increase democratic engagement but unfortunately because of the way that there's been almost a failure of ensuring that these spaces are safer for folks um it has actually diminished the freedom of expression of uh different uh members of our communities whether they're racialized folks whether it's it's women who are uh at the uh, sort of at the at the target uh the receiving end of that type of content and so with the blockade campaign that the canadian race relations foundation partnered with the ywca canada on uh, under taken last year was to really sort of one connect the dots of how this type of space is harming the uh the ability of people to participate fully in these which should be considered almost a public square of sorts um and and to try to you know create more awareness and engage people to think about how do they blockade how do they counter or confront it and it really i mean it really speaks to obviously the importance of uh, civil society but also to the failure for actual proper um ways to address this phenomenon and in the work of of the campaign you know a variety of research uh you know was you know brought to the forefront um in reinforcing what what i'm talking about so 78 percent of canadians for instance said that they were very concerned about the spread of hate speech online young people aged 18 to 29 were far more likely to have experienced online hate than other canadians and that again you know it's it's not all equal um all genders expressed uh, that they'd seen or felt hate, um, but seven out of 10 people who experienced police reported forms of intimidation online are women and girls in Canada. Um, and so again, you know, the that evidence that we're seeing through people's experiences online, you know, keeps coming up. I mean, there again, I can I can go through all the numbers, um, but it really has become such a concern that a majority of Canadians are now in favor of some kind of legislation. And throughout the course of our discussion today, we will talk about uh, more so what the federal government is thinking about doing, and you know, what more they might want to be considering, and what are some of the uh, the real challenges ahead for us. Thank you for that, Amira. I think that analogy of it kind of operating like the wild, wild west is, is really well put um, and, and doesn't actually reflect how we actually govern our like, you know, off screen society. So I really appreciate those and all of the other comments. Um, 
Sabrina, so now that we've set the scene, I want to talk a little bit about both the incentives as well as the dangers of considering political candidacy within the digital environment. Um, and I'm going to want to hear from both of you, but Sabrina, over to you first. What is your opinion of social media and its doubleness following all the research and work? Yeah, well, you know, just to build on Amira's comment, social media has become a vital and necessary tool in the political space because of the pro-democracy aspects behind it. Um, for over a decade, it's proven to be a really important way to connect with constituents and demonstrate authenticity, share information. Um, you know, it's also helped inspire a wide range of people to pursue political roles because they saw someone online that they could relate to. Um, someone who comes to mind uh, on this front for me is Alexandria Ocasio or Casio Cortez. AOC is an inspiration to many young people in Canada. She doesn't represent us. She doesn't have anything to do with us, but she checks so many important representation boxes for us. And social media is a key reason for that. Um, and also during the pandemic, we've seen um, young people, which I'm gonna really broadly define here as under 35, uh, use social media to be active citizens, to mobilize and organize around the issues that they care about. Um, and recent studies about mental health challenges faced by young people during the pandemic have found an association between online civic engagement and well-being. So there's a lot of really good aspects of social media here, but as Amira has noted, we've kind of fallen behind as a society in terms of managing it in a culture and policy-based way. Social media isn't perfect, it's complex. It can be weaponized in a manner that's extremely dangerous. Um, and in the federal election, political parties worked really hard to re recruit diverse candidates in response to an increased uh, uh, ask and standard for representation from our society. Um, so we're interested in how parties will continue on this front. How will they respond to data from projects like Sambot and ensure that they are keeping their candidates safe, that they are supporting their candidates, that they're being responsive to these working conditions, which aren't new. This didn't happen overnight. This hasn't been a slow creep. This has just become the norm. Um, so we're interested on this social media front um, and on the doubleness item, Victoria, to look at how the conditions of work can be addressed here so that the pro-democracy aspects of social media uh, can be secured. Thanks very much for that. And, you know, I want to kind of dig into like the real question that kind of brings us here. And I don't think it's an easy answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it kind of is the doubleness of is social media the enemy of democracy? You know, not entirely, but it's certainly kind of operating at both ends. Um, Amira, something I was reading some of your articles over the weekend, and I saw one really interesting statistic that made me take pause that, that Canadians are among only 8.4% of the world's population who live in a full democracy. And, you know, that goes to show you like our experience is, is not universal. And in fact, it's quite rare. Um, and what I'd like to ask you next is actually about another article you wrote uh, back in March sharing how this is happening at, at different levels. It's not just in, you know, the celebrity politicians and public figures. And um, you wrote about a woman named Carla Beauvais and how she was traumatized by online hate. And I thought that served as a, an important example of the destructive, the destructive impact on women and racialized people. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, that story and what your research has found and what are some of the factors behind this online hate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Carla Bavese's stories, actually, she was featured as part of um, the voices that we were amplifying for the Block Hate campaign. And so I wrote about her experience. So she's a Black entrepreneur living in Montreal, and all, all that she had the only way that she'd really participated, you know, in, in democracy in, in a way that had made her a target was simply to give an interview to a local newspaper about an app uh, that she and her colleagues were developing to help people find black owned businesses. And that's, that's her participation. And when the story went out and was published online, uh, it, 
attracted uh, a lot of hate. And the folks that were, you know, expressing their, their vitriol, uh, actually, some of them uh, looked her up, found out, you know, found her phone number somehow, were, were calling her, were making threats against her so much that she actually feared for her own safety and the safety of her loved ones and had to completely remove herself from being on social media. Um, and, and, and really, until the, the campaign came out and I wrote the article, had been afraid of actually engaging with anyone again online. And so that story, while it's an extreme one, uh, it's not completely out of the ordinary for people who are vocal uh, in some way about whether it's racial justice, whether it's about any other type of controversial issue to find themselves again on that receiving end of hate that can translate into real life consequences. And that is often the fear, you know, it's not only that you have to, for example, check in in your DMs and you see, you know, all of this type of, you know, threats and intimidation that some, some people can experience. We saw it recently, for instance, with journalists in Canada, racialized journalists who had been targeted by a certain political leader um, and, you know, having to go through that. But it is in fact, being concerned about the, the real life consequences. And so what we have seen is that, you know, again, people who are racialized, people who are indigenous, people, uh, women, um, people from the GLBT, uh, SQI communities, all of these folks are definitely more vulnerable uh, to this type of harmful content. And that not only are they disproportionately more likely to experience it, is that again, there really is not a lot that you can do when you are on the receiving end. So there, there are plenty of examples, unfortunately, of people who've had to report that kind of hate, and there are no consequences. Just recently, some of uh, the participants today may be aware of an individual uh, who had been um, you know, putting out terrible, terrible uh, content against uh, a very well-known, prominent Canadian Muslim businessman named Mohammed Fakih, and Mohammed Fakih had to take him to court numerous times to sue him for defamation, uh, go to court, make sure that he would, and he, the, the man kept going, kept spreading these lies online um, until a judge just a few weeks ago said, you know, he keeps contravening all of this and, and, and he was uh, sentenced to be put behind bars. Yet this man's uh, online profile on Facebook continues to exist. He's still on Facebook, despite being convicted and uh, found to be engaging in hate. So the problem is, is that, you know, imagine if that's the experience of a multimillionaire, what, what hope is there for the rest of us to be get, to be getting any actual support um, to address these very real, rea these very realities that I'm describing. And so what we know, and I, and I, uh, referenced it earlier is that while the federal government has acknowledged that there needs to be legislation, there's, as I said, widespread public support. Um, and, and so really it's to wait to see, will that type of legislation that they're suggesting you know, really have an impact. We know that deplatforming, for example, actually works. The Canadian Anti-Hate Network um, has done various um, articles and research and worked with police to get people um, who are spreading hatred online uh, to the attention of the authorities. And for instance, when one white supremacist was removed from YouTube, for example, very quickly, that person's influence waned. Um, you know, a couple, a couple of months ago, he was on a different video platform and he said, only 3% of my audience has followed me. So that's a really huge win. So when we're thinking about this, it means that not only are we obviously diminishing their influence to reach people, but also the, their ability to reach young people. Um, we've actually seen a very disturbing trend that Statistics Canada has pointed out, that teenage boys and young men are disproportionately behind the rise in hate crimes across Canada. 23% um, of people accused of hate crimes in the last 10 years were between the ages of 12 and 17 and were male. And so where are these ideas, uh, you know, being found? They're found online. As, uh, you know, a, a dear friend and colleague, Bernie Farber, often says, you know, decades ago when he was fighting neo-Nazis, you know, they were on street corners with a little pamphlet handing it out. And if they handed out 10 pamphlets in one afternoon, that was a good day. Now folks like this are reaching tens of thousands of people. Um, and if there are no consequences to either them or the platforms for allowing this type of hatred to circulate, and not only is there no consequences, but 
that their content through the algorithm, because of how popular, um, you know, um, angry content uh, becomes and how viral that type of angry content can be, in fact, are being um, shown to more and more people simply by the nature of that content. That is a, a major, major flaw in the system that is really putting people's ability to participate fully in democracy at risk and putting, putting people's lives in, at risk as well. Exactly. And, you know, from what my research has, has shown me as well, that, you know, it's it's reaching people who aren't even necessarily open to it or looking for it initially, but that the algorithm kind of incrementally gets edgier and edgier until things start being, you know, what's that joke? I think like you're three clicks away from white supremacy. It's not a funny joke, but it's one that, you know, is being shared online. So thank you for that, Amira. Um, I want to dig into the safety piece a little bit more. So Sabrina, I'm wondering if like, what you think about, is it safe to be a politician in today's climate? You know, we're seeing the psychological violence, we're seeing it migrate offline. Um, and, and we're also seeing the platforms weaponize misinformation to incite users. So, you know, what would you say about that safety piece? Well, one of the most toxic days that we tracked with Sambot during the election was on the day that Justin Trudeau had gravel thrown at him. So there, there are more substantive studies uh, on this front to cite, but there is a connection between what happens online and what happens in real life. Um, with the Sambot project, as I outlined, you know, women got way more toxicity aimed at them than men. And it's understood that the more well known you are as a politician, the more vitriol um, is going to come your way. So if someone who looks like Justin Trudeau and grew up like Justin Trudeau is going to be getting the most toxicity online because he's so well known, that's going to send a powerful message to a wide range of communities. And if you are entering politics because you want to address the representation issue, you don't see your community in the space and you want to get in there, what, what a sobering reality to understand that the more successful you become, the more popular you, you become, the bigger your profile is, the worse it's going to be online for you. Um, so there, there's a lot to just work through in terms of just how um, dire the circumstance is and how social media is uh, this necessary tool that must be navigated, like you can't avoid it. So um, just to get back to the Sambot data, um, when people walk away from politics, um, you know, based on what we, we were collecting here, it really, for our team, like we really thought about how they're not walking away because they're not resilient enough and that that's part of the discourse right like if you want to be in the public eye you need to be tough and you need to be able to handle it people are walking away now and maybe this was always the case but it seems to be a bit more centered they leave because they think they deserve better and they are right and if that's how they feel imagine what the electorate thinks um, toxicity takes a toll on public participation. Most people are avoiding um, political spaces and political conversations, and it's a minority that is doing harm. And this illuminates a critical and urgent need to evolve not only policies around digital platforms, but also our own cultural norms and expectations, because we've really just sort of been letting the platforms evolve and dictate um, and letting the algorithms just kind of like roam free and evolve without very much sort of consideration about the deep impact they're having to us as a society and, and to us as individuals as well. So political parties have an important role to play here. They can hold those in their direct circles to account. It's not as if the, the harm that we are talking about today online is from these far reaching corners. It's within our own Canadian political establishment as well. So can political parties set standards for conditions of work for their candidates um, or for someone in office? If they did, it could help shift the discourse and start a new chapter for voter engagement in Canada, one that increases public participation, reaffirms those pro-democracy aspects of social media. It would also help address a bigger issue that's holding back public participation in our democracy, and that's the limited public trust. 
So if political parties can respond to this circumstance in a really responsive and direct, candid manner, that would help boost the public's trust in politicians and in the political process. All of that's key to addressing polarization and establishing reasoned discourse as a norm, and that's essential to our democracy. Thank you, Sabrina. And, you know, I'm sure you saw me give a thumbs up there. I think, like, I really applaud what you said in the respect of people do deserve better, because I think it's fair to say that we can critique one another's policy ideas. But when you start to attack people for, you know, the color of their skin or how fit they are, I mean, who has remained fit in this pandemic? Not me. Um, and so I think when it becomes personal and really just about bullying, as opposed to, you know, public discourse and, you know, difference of ideas that we get into really dangerous territory as we're seeing. So I think, you know, we need to talk about the incentivization piece then. Uh, so Amira, bearing all of this in mind, how can we incentivize anyone and especially diverse candidates, knowing they'll disproportionately experience online abuse into running and playing a public role? And how can, how can we set them up for safety and success uh, as, as much as possible given the realities of the risk? Yeah, I mean, so like the, first of all, I think it's, it's really important that we realize how flawed the tools are and the oversight of these tools, which is going to be my theme for and has been the theme, I think. And Sabrina, you know, everything she's describing and Victoria, your research, all of it really is addressing even indirectly the fact that the tools are not working as they were promised that they would work for us. So, for example, imagine this, you know, democracy dialogue that we're having. If we if we were here um, aiming to, you know, go viral. Um, what that means and 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 the, the sort of the, that catch 22 that anyone running for public office faces is that the way the tools have been set up is that they're only going to really get attention by, you know, going and talking in a way that sort of sets off the emotional uh, sort of um, radars of their audience, right? So studies are showing that, you know, if you want to you if you want to get uh, you know, a tweet to go viral. If you want to get the attention, you're going to have to use an emotional word. You're going to, or have to sort of show some kind of quote unquote indignant disagreement. It's not a dialogue anymore. It's not an actual, as you said, Victoria, an exchange of policy ideas. No, if you want to be seen, really seen as a, as a candidate, if you want to be heard, you know, the tool forces you almost to have to, you know, we really come out with that hot take in a way that's going to attract attention. So sometimes, for example, when I just simply tweet something and I don't get much attention, I think, well, I need to be more controversial, I guess. I'm not going to do it just for that purpose. But you can see how the system incentivizes that kind of behavior. And a lot of people who want to get into public office are not interested in that. They actually want to serve the public good. And so it's very difficult to be thinking about how do we encourage people to participate when they can see not only their own way of communicating has to sort of, you know, um, really work with the tools they've been given, but that the fact that their audience themselves as well are shouting at each other and are, are going to start sort of having these, again, those sort of indignant disagreements where it becomes more and more polarized uh, around the issues that they actually want to have a proper dialogue. So I don't know how we encourage people to participate in a, in, in a system where it's functioning this way simply because, again, without proper guardrails on how we function, it's like throwing people into a room and say, just shout as loud as you can at each other. Um, no rules. And I don't think that's fair for anyone. So, when, you know, when you read articles that say, you know, for example, you know, a Jenny Kwan had to install a panic button in her office or uh, Elizabeth May had to get private security consultant to assess their the risk of her and her staff. When you read these kinds of stories, the real fear of being doxxed where your family lives, for example, the, the safety of your children, how do you convince people to participate uh, in the system? And certainly when you're understanding that we need more diverse candidates, when you know white men are disproportionately represented in, uh, in our democracy, in our parliamentary system, and they're the ones who are more likely to run and we definitely need it to be more representative. But how do we do that? It's, it's, it's a really important and big question. And I certainly wouldn't want to be encouraging people to participate until we get this 
right because it's not fair just as sabrina said and victoria you agree with people deserve to be able to participate without having to feel this way and be and their staffers and everyone around uh, around them in this ecosystem that is supposed to allow us to participate in a way that is civil that is that is about dialogue yeah i think civil is a key word and you know in my reading I've been, you know, kind of looking at what are some of the tools and some of the steps that the platforms are taking to try and help this. And, you know, for example, I was looking at the Facebook Women's Safety Hub that was done in partnership with Equal Voice. And while I think it's helpful in terms of being able to kind of protect yourself in the respect of, you know, putting on certain filters and not allowing comments, it, it is dealing with the effect rather than the cause. And I think as long as they're all playing into the cause, which is these harmful algorithms, which is, you know, sensationalizing things and pushing people towards, you know, edgier content, they're, you know, they're still part of the, the cause and, and, you know, mitigating the effect can only do so much. Um, I know we only have a couple more minutes left before we get to questions, which is wild because I feel like we could talk about this for hours. But Sabrina, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, about user behavior and what's, uh, what's leading to it a little bit um, in terms of, you know, how, what about social media enables it to become a gateway for dehumanization and, and an outlet for anger and resentment? And, you know, I, I think both of you can answer this, but how, do, how can we begin to understand the other we're encountering online, especially in the face of, you know, inequity and, you know, disproportionate power and, you know, people are hurting, but it's about how they're expressing it that's very problematic. Well, I mean, I think we've entered into a new era for how we approach technology and democracy. Um, so Amira was just talking about how there's this pressure to be as sensational as possible. And I think we're reaching the limits of how sustainable that approach is. There's only so far you can go. There actually are lines after a while and people kind of get intimidated and bored out of the conversation more or less, and then it's done. So, I mean, you know, Victoria, you're asking really big and important questions today, and we're approaching them as we come out of a pandemic with a really different perspective on how we set boundaries between what should be handled publicly or privately. And we've been paying more attention to how other countries are navigating these types of issues. We've been paying more attention to how other countries have navigated public health measures over the course of the pandemic. And it's kind of just sort of awakened us to the fact that there are a lot of different ways to do things, that Canada is uh, great. There's a lot of really wonderful aspects about this country, but there's a room for improvement. Um, and this gives us a really important opportunity right now in terms of how we shape new norms around civic engagement. How are we supporting it? How are we approaching online political spaces in our country? Uh, if we look at young people during the pandemic, we saw a connection um, for the ones that had, like young people faced tremendous mental health challenges during the course of the pandemic. And a recent study showed that if they had some element of online civic engagement in their life, it had a, an association with their enhanced well being. So it could be the way that we get out of this pandemic has a social media dimension to it. That could be how we narrow a lot of the gaps that we've identified today. But certainly we're at a really critical juncture as a society and as a country. And I hope we can seize this moment to bring forth meaningful change in a, in a really transformational and imaginative way. Thank you, Sabrina. Amira, I have one more question for you before... Um before I ask about what you'll be doing next after this conversation. But I'm just wondering, are, in your opinion, are you know the big platforms the only way? Or are you seeing any evidence that candidates or organizers uh, at the community level or otherwise are using smaller, more private platforms like Signal, which has greater privacy or WeChat, or you know, is there another way, I guess, to kind of instrumentalize and harness the power while protecting from the abuse? Yeah, no, I, I think there, there's always other ways. Do they have the same reach as these, you know, the, the large social media platforms? Absolutely not. So for instance, um, out of Atlantic Canada, I've seen um, uh, community organizers and entrepreneurs create something called a tribe network. And that was to connect uh, Black Nova Scotians together and others who are interested into kind of like a LinkedIn, but for, for Black people, a place where they can connect 
often have conversations and share opportunities and what have you. So that's just one of, of many examples of people trying to find ways to create safe spaces where they can participate. And again, as Sabrina said, you know, find a way to engage, which is so important, especially in a pandemic, especially if we remember those days where online was the only way we, we could see people. And so not being able to feel safe when we went online uh, was really, really detrimental to so many folks. Um, wh whether it's WhatsApp, whether it's Signal, all of these um, platforms do create a, a space for people to have groups, to organize, to share information. Sometimes that is just as problematic as sort of the more open platforms. You know, we know, for example, with the pandemic that all sorts of misinformation was being shared, but at the same time, that double side of it again was that there was a lot of important information that was being shared as well. So these types of alternatives to the more, you sort of the broader, the more mainstream social media are available. And not only that, what we're also seeing is that, you know, many communities um, trying to take back the sort of the autonomy or their own ability to engage by looking for other solutions. For example, the Chinese Canadian National Council for Social Justice they actually teamed up with um, a professor at the University of Toronto to figure out a way to remove anti-Asian hate from users' feeds online, simply again, because the current way of, of getting things removed, content removed off Facebook or other places was not and has not been sufficient. So you're seeing people trying to grapple with what is a ginormous issue, but it's simply because of really the slow pace uh, of holding these uh, social media platforms accountable who will say the right things and who will take these steps. But again, the main problem is that we don't have much insight and in how the algorithms work, academics, researchers who try to understand how uh, things are being monetized uh, on the other end of, of, of Facebook, for instance, or other large platforms, they're not getting that insight. They're not able to sort of understand what's happening sort of under the hood, as it were. And this is, again, creating that sense that, yes, we can be told all the right things, but at the end of the day, we still truly are not able to see a real uh, address of these harms in a way that matters. And that's why the regulation is going to be so critical uh, going forward. Thank you, Amira. And so we have some amazing questions coming into the chat. So I think I'm going to save the question of, you know, how are you carrying this work forward and call to actions for the end so we can leave people on that note. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I want to say thank you to Natalie for sending in a question for Sabrina. So the question is regarding the Sambot data, how many of the toxic tweets came from bots? Yeah, that's a really that's a really good question. So we couldn't get at that week to week. It was um, a really crazy and hectic time to be monitoring during the election. But that's part of what we're looking at right now as we put our final report together. So we didn't collect any uh, identifying information from any of the senders, um, but we can check for whether it was a bot based on other patterns of weirdness, like what time the tweets were sent, how many were sent, and um, we're going to have a lot of visualizations of the data in our report. So that's certainly top of mind as we're putting this together and, you know, has really uh, critical implications to who's driving and shaping our political discourse. Is it us or not? Um, but certainly there were a lot, a lot of human beings that were sending a lot of the toxic messages, to be sure. Thank you. And I think that's, you know, an exciting report for all of us to look out for next, I think, as you further delve into and culminate that data. Um, so the next question is from Wallace. So I'm interested and shocked, Wallace says, by the statistic that identifies that boys aged 12 to 17 play a significant role in the production of toxic and hateful online messaging. Amira, can you please talk about how the high school environment or education system can take a first step in uh, mitigating or altering this? Yes, no, thanks for that question. So to clarify, though that statistic was about real life hate crimes. So police reported hate crimes. Wow. Um, and so it's not just the, the messaging, it's it's the 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 link that we are extrapolating from that type of data is the exposure of hateful messaging online may be the cause of this type of activity in such a young 
age group. And so when it comes to education in schools, obviously this is a place where we should be ensuring and thinking about, again, how do we equip young people with being able to identify uh, misinformation, hate, how do they report, how do they counter uh, that type of hateful uh, rhetoric. Um, the Canadian Anti-Hate Network has actually developed an entire um, workshop for educators on how to talk about white supremacy and that type of radicalization that young pe people might be encountering online. So these are topics that a lot of teachers, educators are not sure about how to talk about and how to, how to represent to their students. And so definitely, definitely that type of stat should alarm us all um, and should underlie why it's so important. And then again, the other point, of course, is that media literacy, right? So when we talk about people's ability to trust institutions, to trust the media, a lot of times it is because the media literacy could be stronger, that we need to be teaching people how to identify what is a good source of information versus what is not a good source. And if that's not going to happen at the school level, then, you know, when will it happen? Um, and so there's all sorts of efforts underway. Media Smarts, for example, is a wonderful organization that provides resources for schools and there are others. Um, and, and so it's definitely it is extremely, extremely, uh, should be extreme high priority for us to, to be addressing. I can just add to that Absolutely. to note that uh, if we if we really want to solve this issue, a key element is going upstream. And if we look at how digital media literacy is taught in Canada, in many instances, very little has evolved since the 90s. Uh, the internet and other digital spaces have totally transformed just in the last two years alone. So I don't think we want a 90s lens on how we're handling uh, what's in front of us today. And in many cases, there might be an exceptional program, but it's not mandatory. And so we're missing a really key opportunity as a country to confirm democratic capability as a competency uh, in young people. That's a key way for us to emerge from the pandemic with robust civic engagement. We have to be responsive to what's actually going on and help people, you know, onboard into civic engagement with supports in their schools and communities. And just wanted to add, Media Smarts is great, as Amira noted, and Civics has a tremendous program called Control F that's about teaching media literacy to students and teachers as well. Thank you for that, Sabrina. And, you know, I want to say how much we appreciate having your time with us because look at how many other people want to speak to you as well. <laughs> 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 with your phone ringing um but you know Sorry I think, about that. <laughs> no all good I feel like you know we, we just appreciate it um so yeah I think one comment I wanted to make uh just bearing in mind the time is I think you know it does sound shocking that this is on the rise with young people because I think that there's a bit of a, a want a belief that every generation will be you know more progressive more equal more accepting and you know I know we talked about this in our briefing call but I want to shout out all of our friends Sahar Shafiq who said in a media interview that we have to remember that teens are growing up in a post 9-11 generation where there is a ton of anti-islamophobia this is the world we're coming of age in and so we have to remember that in every moment and that's why you know to both of your points um doing this at this within the schools and at home is extremely important uh one of my friends is actually having her baby shower this weekend and she's asked for books rather than cards and so i bought her anti-racist baby by Abraham candy because you know i think that that's an important book for every like expected parent to have um, so we have two more great questions that came in from our audience. Uh, so Daniel is asking, can Sabrina and Amira please comment on how cancel culture and debates about freedom of expression online in this context contributes to silencing dialogue? So this is actually a question I had too. How, how free is speech right now? I'm not sure who'd like to take that, but if, if someone's feeling uh, inspired to answer, please go ahead. It's, that's a tr it's a tricky question, right? Because uh, you know, um, one of the one of the main issues when we're talking about freedom of expression is that you know we absolutely want to ensure that these tools continue to hold the promise that again we've been talking about 
from the outset is that it, it democratizes, it allows more and more people to have access to being able to speak and share. We don't have gatekeepers in the way that we used to, you know, decades ago, where it was like an editor would decide whether or not your voice mattered enough, right? And so when we've seen the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement or other important social movements that have been able to use these tools to spread really important information, it's been extremely important. And then one of the one of the real concerns about trying to legislate and address these problems is that will some of these uh, efforts to um, to create those guardrails will they inadvertently force social media platforms to quickly take down too much content and can that impact those very communities that have been using them whether they're indigenous land defenders whether again it's people who are addressing issues of um, uh, social racial justice etc so freedom of speech it, the the problem is is that you know whether it's cancel culture or whether it's take down, uh, take down regimes of trying to remove harmful content, there's always going to be those who say we're going too far or we're not going too far enough. And that's why actually the federal government is trying to find a balance with that with their recent proposal um, of trying to, you know, create what they've what they're suggesting is a digital safety commission, a digital recourse council of Canada. We don't have time to go into all of them, and a digital safety commissioner. And you know, an advisory board that would try to sort of provide input to how they regulate all this. A lot of people are nervous. Is this going to go too far? Is this going to limit or hamper? But for those, who, the, the vast majority of people who are experiencing this hate are saying something has to be done. We cannot leave. And, and what's the research that we've just seen from Sabrina and what we're all talking about, clearly something has to be done what exactly and how I'm sure there's going to be mistakes made along the way and that may indeed wind up causing uh, issues with freedom of expression and that has to be rectified right away because it's such an important pillar of our democracy and we don't want to see that but again freedom of expression for who and that will always have to be part of the question. Yeah we're seeing a disruption of the default and a really critical take on privilege in our society right now. You know we have a completely different vocabulary in the mainstream for how we talk about power uh, in Canada and in our communities. So it's fascinating to see uh, a you know broad concern largely from groups who have um, enjoyed a lot of privilege being concerned about canceled culture being canceled or cancel culture um, so it's interesting to follow the current in terms of you know is this about your discomfort or is it about another community's experience of um, long-standing violence and systemic barriers so yeah it's going to be a little uncomfortable there's going to be some tension to unpack along the way there and there's going to have to be a really direct conversation about what is in the best interest of the collective and what is uh, about the individual. And when we talk about rights and freedoms and liberties and justice, that can all get mixed up together in a way that is confusing and then land someone on a social media platform where they're getting misinformation and then we have a huge problem. So there's you know a lot of work to be done within our culture and we can look to our leaders for clarity on the way forward because there are common values, there are shared norms that we have in terms of a basic standard for dialogue and engagement with one another. And I think what we're talking about today is coming through this very kind of chaotic and complex time, but having a sense of just like, okay, well, let's get back to basics here. Like, what do we really want out of life? What do we want out of our communities? And the pandemic has given us incredible data of inequities that were longstanding and given us a fresh perspective on how we can approach this information in a healthy and constructive way. Thank you, Sabrina. Uh, you know, I think one thing to keep in mind for all of us, and I know you two know, very, know it very well, is that, you know, freedom of expression does not mean freedom from responsibility. And I think people have to really keep that in mind. Uh, we've got about a minute left. The time has absolutely flown, but I want to uh, do one more question. And also there have been a number more that have come into the chat. So I just want to let you know that the ones we don't get to today, I'm going to ensure also still get answered, but um, I'm going to pack it up maybe with my last question too. So Jocelyn is asking, do Sabrina and, Amir and Amira have any advice or training recommendations for communicators and or social media managers combating harassment online for their organizations? So maybe we can um, have you answer that and then also like the call to action 
action kind of next steps that you invite people to take following this conversation. And then, uh, and then that will be it. Um, well, there's, there's lots to draw on. Um, I'm just thinking off of the top of my head, but Informed Opinions has really excellent resources and workshops. And I think Sherry Graydon is, uh, is in this event today. And so I would encourage you to check that out. And I think, uh, I think that question points at the need for there to be just kind of a common practice, common standard, a go-to uh, for resources. When we were reporting on the Sambot data, every journalist and producer I talked to said, oh yeah, me too, we get this as well. So it's not as if this is uh, exclusive to certain sectors or professions. It's a broad problem and there's common lessons to be learned from, from across the board, but informed opinions would be my go-to for today. Thank you. Amira? I would just say it's so important that whoever is monitoring social media for an organization and if there's going to be a controversial issue that's being discussed or described or political staffers, for example, I can only imagine those who've had to support different politicians and seeing that really wears on people's mental health. It's really important that we create those safe spaces to talk about it, to address it, to provide people a break from it if they need to. Um, so making sure that it's being acknowledged is number one. That's well said. Thank you for that. And uh, before we knew it, we are out of time, but I wanted to say thank you very much to both of our guests for your time, your brain power, you know, your brilliance, your research, and all the amazing work that you're doing um, to shed light on these issues and advocate for safer spaces for all of us and, and really the defense of democracy in social media. I also want to say thank you so much to all of our guests uh, on behalf of myself and everyone at the exchange for joining us today. Uh, we really enjoyed having you here and getting your opinions and we can't wait to see you at the next session. Take care.